Amen. So you got your notepads? You got ready to take? I got some great stuff for you today. Amen. Um, there's a lot of questions going on, and there's a lot of people that seem to be bound by fear and uh, bound by what they hear maybe on the news or the narratives that are going around. But, you know, you and I get our news from a different source. We get our news from the gospel. Can you say amen? And for the poor, God has provision to make you wealthy. To the sick, God has given you a position in Christ to make you healthy. Can you say amen? Good news for us. Now, for people who seem to be bound by fear, the scripture says in 1 John that perfect love casts out fear. For fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So basically, what I have to share with you, the truth about our time with God, is a cure to any fear or anxiety that a person may have. The key is there's something that we need to be doing to cause the results. We need to be tapping a source that has been given us. Can you say amen? So good morning, saints. Welcome to this briefing. Today we're going to share the key of abundant life, how to overcome fear, and how to destroy any work or tactic that the enemy may want to throw at you. Say, that sounds like good news to me. But, you know, I'm not the one just telling you this. This is not my opinion. This is actually scripture I'm going to be giving you today. And we're going to build our life on scripture. What does it say? If you would be a hearer and a doer, you're like a wise man or woman that builds your house upon a rock. And when the floods come and the COVID hits, it will rattle the world, but it will not shake the one who's founded on the rock and the rock being the one that hears and does. Everyone say, I'm a hearer, I'm a doer. I'm a hearer, and I'm a doer. You see, God has a place for every believer in him, where he will hide us in the cleft of his protection. But there's some things that we need to do. We need to surrender to the Lord. We need to make peace. We need to yoke up. We need to learn from him. We need to sit down and find out why God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we as Christians vacillate too much. So we need some cures, Pastor Curie. Please tell us. Remember, the disciples, they came to Jesus and they talked with Jesus. And they became disciples because Jesus approached them and knew their name, knew their character. But did you notice that everybody that approached Jesus was changed. Do you believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then when we approach, when we spend time with Jesus, we should be changing from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. The whole purpose of this exposure to God is to settle us back in Him, to take the enemy works and lies and neutralize them to encourage us to walk on with the Lord, to be with him, to be fulfilled in him. And you know what? There's not a devil in hell that should be able to keep us from it. But there are some Christian disciplines that we need to learn. We need to learn to be men and women of prayer. And when should we start off our prayer every day? In the morning, the early bird catches the worm, my dad used to say. Actually, it is a scripture, but it says the diligent get their needs met. Amen. He, he blesses those that diligently seek him. So there's a, and the diligence, there's a, a need to be with God. Now, you and I eat because we're hungry. We drink water because we're thirsty. But do we go after God because we're needy? And because we need him so much. Amen, somebody. Here's some points I want you to consider. Number one, we as believers must have quality time with God. There's no such thing as a believer having a victorious life without spending quality time with God. 
For God, in that quality time that we spend with Him, that's the time He transforms us. That's the time He matures us. See, there's a lot of people teaching out there that we learn through the elements of life and stumbling and going through life that things teach us lessons. I, I want to let you know there's a half deal on those kind of lessons if people survive. No. God says, you make your peace with Him. I and the Father will come and live in you. And then I and the Father will walk in you and we will talk in you and we will be with you and the Spirit of God will guide you into all truth. You will find a place of refuge, a place of strength, a place of power in me. This is the perfect love that we have and absorb when we spend that quality time with God. Amen. So we as believers must have quality time with God. This is when we pray, not if. Two, the more time with God, the more favor and grace builds in our life. He said it. He says, those of you, when you pray, go in, shut the door, right? This is Matthew. And he says, and then pray to your Father who's in the secret place. And the Father who sees you in the secret place will, now listen, this is the point I want you to get, will reward you openly. In other words, people who spend the quality time with God, the favor and the grace that's on their life is evident to anybody that watches them or sees them. Why? Because their stability and their favor comes directly from God, not from man, not from society, not from the news. Hello? It comes from spending that quality time with God. Now, how many here know that when you spend quality time with God, He enriches you, He opens your eyes, He helps you to listen and to understand greater things? And to, for the life of me, I can't figure out why people don't meet with God. Why they don't take the time? Maybe they don't know all of that's waiting for them. Why they sit in the presence of God and exchange life and breath and presence. Amen? Those, this is my third point, those who take the time to be with God will display life and grace. Why? The favor of God, because their exposure to God is evident to all. Now, we have some examples of that. We remember when Moses went up into the mountain and he, and he, he was... Uh, uh, saw the burning bush and God spoke to him and when he came finally when he came back down he had to put a veil over his face can you tell me why he was glowing the presence of God transformed him so much he was projecting a glow of God now folks think about that is God a respecter of persons why don't we stay in the presence of God long enough to get dosed with God's grace and power so we leave with a glow of God. But in the New Testament, we don't need to veil our face. We need to open our lips and share the good news of the miracle worker that lives in our heart and wants to be in the lives of those who need him. Our text for today is Hebrews 11.6. Let me read it to you. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Through faith, the elders obtained a good report. But the Bible says that there are a lot of fear and anxiety the, en the enemy tries to throw out at us. So if we know perfect love casts out fear, who is perfect love? God. So if you're having any fear problems, any fear issues, running around whether to wear a mask, not to wear a mask, use wisdom, but don't operate in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a power and of a sound mind. But that quality time with God, God takes all fear from you. Takes all anxiety from you. Just that time with the Lord, first thing. He 
begins to saturate you and begins to remove those things from you so you don't get up and enter your day with fear and anxiety, wondering what the moment's going to bring you. I remember talking to a pastor, and I, and I had to say to him, this is a pretty big pastor. What I mean by that, a large congregation. Having a large congregation or small congregation doesn't mean a pastor is successful or not successful. God called me for individuals, for their hearts to see that they're trained and equipped. He didn't call me to build a great big edifice. Okay? Now, if he wants to do that, that's great. But it's the heart of the individual. Can you say amen? So, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, we can't approach God in fear. God, what am I going to do? Ring in your hands. Oh, God, oh, God. What does that say? That says you have no prayer life. Because you're bound by what you feel. That should be taken care of first thing in the morning with Jesus. Those words should never come out of your mouth. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. If you have God in the inside of you, you have nothing to fear. Hello? Fear is not of God. Think about Adam in the beginning. When God used to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, right? And then when they fell, when God came, it says they heard God walking in the garden and they hid themselves. You see, if you don't expose yourself to God first thing and just get soaked with God every day, fear will try to get a hold of you. You'll try to move away from the presence of God. Oh, I don't want to go to church. I've done some embarrassing things. Listen, God says, where are you, Adam? Are you in the bushes? You must eat of the pre that the lion devil told you to eat of. Folks, let's take the fruit and let's put that fruit, fear. Don't take the fruit. Fear is given. Fear is suggested. Fear is on the radio. Fear is on the news. But guess what? Jesus eradicated fear and says, Come out to me, all those that labor and are heavy laden. You're bound by the worldly fears of life, and I will give you rest. Come on, take the yoke upon you, and let me teach you the ways of the kingdom. Woohoo! I get excited about it. This morning, God has some great things to say. He says, don't panic. A wave of the Spirit is moving across the land. And it will spread up into Canada. It will move down into Europe and into Asia. And this Spirit is the last move of God's hand to bring in the souls, bringing in the sheaves, Bringing in the sheaves. God's collecting. The angels are going now into the four winds and gathering those that have a heart fixed to God. A heart that is true. Even in the book of Revelation, it says the angel of the Lord will come and he will search the hearts of people and he will anoint those whose hearts are pure like a virgin to God. That's you. How can we be like that? Isn't God coming for a church without spot or wrinkle? Boy, I tell you what, smelling like smoke a lot of the church. Hiding in foxholes. Complaining about each other. Instead of praying for your nation. Come on, we need to get together. We need a dose of the ghost in the morning so we smell like the Lord in the day. Now, but without faith, it's impossible to please them. For he who comes to God, see, that's me, must believe, now must believe that he is. When you go to pray, do you believe God's going to meet you? Yeah. When I, got, when, I, when I go anywhere, I know that I'm going in God. And he says, must believe that he is, and look at this, and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The word diligent sometimes leaves the understanding of some people. It means to get after it. How many has ever had a, 
a piece of clothes that you liked, and then you try to get together a plan to get it, maybe a piece of equipment, maybe a computer, you know, and you went diligently after it. Can you say, man, we can understand. I'm using that as an example. Well, we need to do the same thing to get diligently after God and especially on those areas that we're lacking. You need to go after it diligently. Why am I bound with fear? Why am I afraid? Let's diligently go to God and let's find out so he can reward us openly. You know, I used to be a sinner, but now I'm filled with God. How did that happen? God. Are you with me? A couple of points I want to give you. Adam was made in God's image, right? And likeness, yet he fell throwing all of that away and opening his humanity into a new realm of fear. Second of all, Jesus came as the last Adam to rescue our, us from our our fate of death and secure our salvation and pay the full price for our restoration. See, I'm bought and paid for. What does that mean? That actually means that you should let the one who bought and paid for you run your life. After all, he went to hell and back for it. We'd be better off. Let's move right on. Also know this. That God will remake us into the image he first planned to make us. You see, we got sidetracked in Adam, didn't we? We fell in Adam. But God says, you come to me and I will restore you. I will make you a new creature and I will teach you how to walk in that new creation. I will teach you how to tap the abundance of life. And then I will help you in every area that you fall short in to see that you get it. Just hang with me and don't do your own thing. Folks, God's asking us, and I'd say over four years now, he told me specifically, tell your congregation that they need to pray. Not because you're not praying, Harder than ever before because he knew what was coming. How many know God's so far ahead of everything? And you know, if you meet with him, he's going to let you in on it. He's going to show you things to come. You see, but people are not meeting with him. Oh, meet with him. Oh, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, everything. <gasps> it's, I'm ready for the day. How about asking him for what's going to happen in a week? What about what God's been telling you? I love to interview people and say, what's God been saying to you specifically about your life? It's important, isn't it? So God will remake our vile and corrupted body back into an original state, but we know until then we have to be with God consistently. So we need to watch and pray. Well, go with me to Mark 14, please. We're going to look at verse 32 through 42. Jesus makes a statement. This is when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was going to be betrayed. But Jesus asked his disciples to pray with him. And because we're talking about our time with God, I want to show you how tricky the enemy is, what he did with the disciples, and how you and I have a cure for it. So they came to the place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. You see, he's going to go and die for our sins. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. Do what? Boy, can you imagine you got into prayer this morning with God and God says, stay here and watch. But God, I made an appointment. We need him 
to say to us, stay here a little longer. We need it. We all need it. Follow on. So he went a little further and fell to the ground and prayed as it were possible the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. How about in prayer, Lord? Not my will, but what you will for me today. What do you will for me this week? Lord, let me not get in the way of it. I get up every morning, one of the first words that comes to me is, it's a new adventure. Today's a new day. You even heard the Psalms that says, there may be sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Why? I mean, some of you might have even experienced what I just said in the scripture. Your mind's going kind of crazy and, you know... Maybe uh, nature is saying, get up and go, and whatever the thing, you're having this crazy dream. And then when you sit up and finally wake up in the morning, you find out that's just a bunch of nonsense. And joy comes, that's not the way it is at all. Well, take that and think about that. That's exactly what Satan is doing through the media and through this world, is trying to discourage human beings from finding Jesus as their Savior and accepting them. We're not talking about joining the church. We're talking about joining God and having God remove fear and anxiety and problems and teaching us how to spend some time with them so he lets us in on what's coming. Folks, I'm going I'm, I'm to say this to you. Two things are coming. Some worse things are coming than you can imagine and some mighty, mighty great things are coming. Which one are you expecting? Of course. Because God says, you follow me, and these blessings will follow you. When your eyes are off on the enemy, and when you're looking at the negatives, you're filled with fear and frustration. Hello? No. You meet with God in the morning, you dial in, you hook up, he includes you in on what's going to go on. He says, he might even say today, take it easy. Just enjoy me. Now, let me ask you, has anybody ever heard God say something like that to you? Because, you know, he's interested in how you feel and your health and your strength. And he knows that you're one of those go-getters, but he doesn't want you to kill yourself doing it. He wants you to flow with him. You know, Jesus never was in a hurry to get anywhere, but he was always on time. And if you follow God in his footsteps and he leads you, you'll never have to be late at anything or mess up anything because Jesus is guiding your steps. Say amen, somebody. I mean, some of our minds are going, whoa, okay, so... So, and as he prayed, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Now, then he came to and found them what? Sleeping. And said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch with me one hour? Folks, there's something about an hour in prayer. It doesn't have to be directly one hour. But there's something about that time where you spend at least that length with God an hour. Maybe God thinks that that's what it's going to take to get to you is an hour of exposure to God. But really, I remember years and years and years ago, there was a guy named Lee, Pastor Lee or something. He said, can you pray with me one hour? He had a whole seminar of learning to pray with God an hour. And he says, if you do it this way, you'll have a whole hour done and you won't even be finished. But see, rather than be a calisthenic, I'd rather have you enjoy God in that time with God than an hour. You're not timing, well, I, I can give you an hour, God, you know. Rather, you're just caught up and God just saturates you. And maybe you can get an entire hour in in prayer in 10 minutes. 
depending on how distracted sometimes we get. And then he came and he found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Hear that? It's a lack of prayer that causes our flesh to be tempted. Okay? And then, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he had returned, he found them asleep again. For the eyes of them were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. It was the woman you gave me, God. God. <laughs> Amen. So then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We know Judas came and then all of that came. A couple of points I want to bring up. Watchful prayer keeps us from fleshing it out. Can you say amen? Instead of saying, you know, that person did it wrong, watchfulness and prayer will pray for that person the next time do it right. Being watchful in prayer. I will set watchmen on the wall. What are the watchmen for, Pastor Kerry? There to watch for the enemies working so they can pray against it. They were there to alert the people within the walls of the city. And they were also there to let People opened the gate when a group of traders were coming in. I don't mean trade tours. I mean group of, you know, uh, business people and all coming in. They need to open the wall of the city. So a watchman also looks for the caravans of trade. Hello? And see, we get people who are were intercessors and praying. But I'm going to ask you this question. I don't see very many of them anymore. Remember, you can go back 10, 15 years and everybody was in the prayer meeting. They were seeking God and they were doing things and everything. Where are the prayer meetings now? Where are the people gathering in the name of the Lord to pray? One could put 1,000 to flight, two could put 10,000 to flight. So God will set you as a watchman. It doesn't matter whether there's a dozen of us doing that or whether you're doing that, you just obey God. Because when God tells you to do something and you do it, it will accomplish what he needs to get accomplished. Remember, there's one thing God needs for us to do to help God. Did you know that? That is to ask him to get involved in people's lives or our country's wealth or lives because maybe they didn't ask them. I can actually stand here and tell you I am saved because somebody prayed for me. My parents weren't saved. I led them to the Lord. So I know it wasn't my parents, but possibly my grandparents. Possibly relatives says, God, get that guy. You know? But thank God, praying and taking, our prayer is such a powerful thing. Now listen. He came the third time they were sleeping. Was Jesus discouraged? He's about ready to get killed. Kind of reminds me of the people that really have a relationship with God. Nothing scares them. They're not afraid of anything. Folks, if somebody did do something strange and all of us end up passing away, it's graduation day. Amen. See, we get our minds so locked up in how we feel and what's not happening, what's going on, and it takes God to loosen that thinking up and by spending time with him. To exercise and to rub us down with some good old Holy Ghost marinade. To tenderize our meat and get us ready for service. Can you say amen? I like that illustration. Let's get in the bag of marination. Let God for, a, for at least an hour shake, shake all the sin out of you. 
you know. Actually, I'm just hamming it up with you. But we need to soak in his presence. We need God everywhere, everything about our life. Can you say amen? All right, a couple of points. Watchful prayer keeps us from fleshing it out. It also keeps us from the snares of the enemy, the attacks on our flesh. Two, if Jesus prayed, then we must as well. If he always sought his father, he sought his father about all these different things that we need to seek our father. Can you say amen? So, if Jesus prayed, then we must as well pray. Our prayer time with God adjusts us for the life that's set before us. Thirdly, time with God tunes us up quiets down our mind, all negative thinking. It shuts down the repulsiveness of our flesh before God. And it also encourages us and, and, and builds us up so we stand out as a vessel that's been polished by God's presence. Listen to this. Remember, our exposure to God is what stabilizes our lives. It's also what shields us from the enemy's lies. Can you say amen? Proverbs 133, listen to this. It says, but whoever listens to God will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Proverbs 133. Folks, we need to watch and stay in prayer. This is the last days. This is not a time for you 20 years, the way you had 20 years ago, where you prayed when you felt you needed to, and everything was rosy. I want to tell you why it was so powerful 20 years ago. Because of all the saints, the hundreds of years of the saints that prayed on before then. And then revival broke out, and then the following generations didn't continue that particular labor of love, of intercession. And so what happened is, like any revival, flesh and mankind shuts down the power of God. One of the greatest ways that the Azusa Street revival was shut down is people got their eyes off of God and what he was telling them onto man, and they made denominations from it. Are you with me? God doesn't want us to divide from each other. He wants us to unite together. He wants us to pray together. He wants to see because our exposure to God changes us. Just like the exposure to some godly people will change you, sometimes for the worse, God's presence changes you always for the better. Are you with me? So we need to spend that time. Watch and stay in prayer. Listen, Luke 21, 36 says this. Watch therefore. What are we watching for? Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things which will come to pass and stand before the Son of God. Notice the word pray. God wants us to stay alert and to be prayerful. Can you say amen? Doesn't mean we can't have a nap once in a while. Okay? Knowing about our covenant. You know, when I pray, I don't even think God's not going to answer it. Because I have a covenant with God that cannot be touched. God the Father made a covenant with God the Son who represented us. God the Father representing God. And God, with God, married us together by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and cut a covenant. And guess what? If we pray according to what God does, did through Jesus Christ, our prayers will move heaven and earth. God, I don't like what's going on in my country. I'm asking you to pluck up and root out all the characters that are doing Satan's will. Should be one of your prayers. Hello. God knows he's just, isn't he? He knows who's the, the, who's the no good Nick. And who is the good Nicks? He knows how to separate the sheep from the goats. All right, so let's check this out now. In these days that you and I live in, there's a lot of darkness out there. 
But prayer keeps us from falling in the temptations of the flesh and to the pits and the tricks and the snares of the enemy. I like what Proverbs 6, 2 says, we are snared by the words of our mouth. That's why never talk about what the devil's doing to you. How's the devil going to figure out what he's doing to you anyway? He's going to make a suggestion, and it's not until we talk about it that he figures out you heard him. Moving right along. You see, our time and exposure to God will transform us. And if you feel like you're not being transformed fast enough, meet with them a little more. Well, Pastor Kerry, what if I kind of fall asleep when I'm praying? Just be in his presence. You probably will. You've been staying awake with worries and anxieties, and now you're with the Prince of Peace. You might get a little sleepy and relax with a little rest. That's good. But if God is speaking to you and you fall asleep like these Yehus did in the garden, that's oppression. Moving right along. So quality time before God. Let's make a decision right now to make quality time with God just long enough to know that we're clicking. So I'll just tell you, when I meet with God in the morning, usually I'm up before my wife, and just God sees fit, and I go into my office, and I just spend some time talking with them. We don't really talk about heavy things or anything. We just talk and exchange. Then he encourages me. Maybe I'll sing him a silly song, and we'll talk. And then I said, Lord, I know that you are quieting my mind. You're shutting down my flesh. You're building up my spirit, and you're getting me ready for the day. I want to make sure I don't leave here until you've made all the right adjustments. My oil's been changed. Amen. All of my fluids are up. Amen. My attitude's correct. And just stay there long enough. It doesn't take very long at all. And talk to God that way. Remember, you're taking your vehicle in for maintenance. What do you mean by that, Pastor Kerry? Flesh. You're taking your vehicle in for maintenance. And God's going to shut it down so that you can live unto God in the realm of the Spirit. God's the only one who can shut your flesh down. It isn't you promising to quit something that's going to cause you to quit it. It's you getting with God and so, saying, Lord, I want to quit doing that because it's hurting me. It's a bad testimony for my kids, and I'm asking you to help me overcome it. And God says, all right, let's partner up. He never says no about those things. He doesn't have a problem. We do. So he loves working it out with us. Amen? I just love God working it out with us. And I'm going to let him. So catch this. Quality time before God is what all of us need. There's no getting away from it. Go with me to Matthew chapter, verse 6. Again, Jesus is talking about don't pray like the heathen pray. Matthew 6, verse 8 through 15, listen, he's going to go through what we call the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. Now, this prayer is simply not the way to pray, but is what to cover in your prayer. Do you understand? So you don't go, Hallowed Father, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. No. Each one of those things is an instruction of how to be in the presence of God. Each one. So let's pick up here in Matthew 6, verse 8. Therefore do not be like them, the heathen, who use vain repetitions. For your Father knows the things that you have need of. How many here know God knows what we have need of? He's not keeping those things from you. Before we even ask, why do we ask then, Pastor Kerry? Because we have not, because we ask not. God knows what we have need of, but we need to ask him so he legally can bless us. You don't ask him and he tries to bless us, then he's trespassing and Satan can accuse him. 
That's why God needs us to ask God to get involved, stay involved. That's why I want to encourage you to meet with him every day because that involvement what makes us champions. Involvement with God. Are you still with me? Okay. So in this matter, when you are spending time with God, pray. Father, in Jesus' name. Everyone say that with me. Father, in Jesus' name. Because when Jesus taught this to his disciples, they were still in the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't died and rose again. So now in that day, the day that Jesus rises from the dead, you will ask me, Jesus, nothing. But whatever you ask my Father in my name, he will give it. So now you'll understand. It says, it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What is that all about? Why the hallowing? Praise and worship. But there's something that praise and worship does with us. It connects us to God. So what Jesus is saying, when you say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, I make a connection and submission to you. You are holy. I worship you. I adore you. Connect. Now, You've got God's ear. Don't be a dummy. Open your mouth and insert foot. That's how you get God's ear. God, I love you. I, I just love it. I see every pastor wants to hear the congregation, each individual pray, to see where you're located. How is your prayer life? I'm going to start calling on you to lead prayer. You better start practicing. You child of God, are you going to let the devil know that you've not been a person of prayer? Now, I'm going to say something else you might not like, but it's important. It didn't say think your prayer. It says speak. Why? It takes real wisdom to utter words of intelligence. You certainly can think a million miles a minute. And God, I'm not saying God doesn't listen. He hears those prayers in our mind. But we believe in our heart and we confess with our, and it's made unto us salvation. So in your prayers, you didn't think yourself, Jesus, into your heart. I sure like to have Jesus. That's hope. You formalize prayers because it takes intelligent thought to talk before Almighty God. But when you do, you're going to be very clumsy at it, but continue. Because then he'll help you formulate and talk and relax in his presence and his exposure to you will drive the enemy crazy and it will quiet your flesh, it will quiet your mind, and it will literally amplify the God creature inside of you. And that's what Satan doesn't want. He doesn't want to see you getting up in the morning and he's fleeing for his life. You know, when Denise gets up in the morning, you know what the devil says? Oh my God, she's up. Run for your life! Right? Come on! Well, that's who we really are, who lives in us. But sometimes we get up, <laughs> well, that's okay, but don't stay that way. Can you say man? Because sometimes we do. I'm, I'm talking for one, two here. Now watch. So our Father, which have in heaven, make that connection. Give us this day our daily bread. You've got to realize when, when Jesus is saying this, is you have to keep a receiver of recepting or receiving open. When he says in that prayer, give us today our daily bread, you're saying, I'm open for you to supply my need. Remember, you're sitting in the presence of God praying this. You're not walking down the street going, our Father, which art in heaven, that'll be like No, 
You are intimate with God and you say, give us this day our daily bread. And in the Greek, it's literally a demand upon what's promised. So you're not demanding from God, but you're saying, God, you said you'd give us our daily bread. Then it says, forgive us our trespasses. Okay? So our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Make the connection. Your kingdom come. What is the kingdom? You guys have been taught well. Dominion, power, and influence. Your kingdom power. Your dominion come. Your influence come. Hello? Your favor come. What happened at Pentecost? It all came. Now, when did that time come for you? When you said, Jesus, come into my heart. Then all of that provision entered you and you became a new creation in Christ. Check this out. So, then it says, be it done on earth as it is in heaven. How is it in heaven? Nobody's sick in heaven. Nobody's got the flu in heaven. Nobody's lame. Nobody's blind. Right? So that tells us, Jesus said, when you pray and ask me stuff, put no limit on it. Just think what it's like in heaven. So does God want you to be healed? Because nobody's sick in heaven. See, that's just another thing. Be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then it says, give us this day our daily bread, supply our need, and forgive us our debts. How many here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, we all have either owed somebody something or had a bill to pay or have bills to pay. But when you say, God, forgive me my debts, then he supplies the means to pay them. Hello? But if you won't even acknowledge that you owe people things, then you will still be bound. But the moment, Lord, you say, Lord, forgive me the debt. You know that car dealership? I ripped them off of $40. And I should really let them know that's when you get all the mind wrestling. No, you're basically, Lord, forgive me of all the debts. I earned a ton of debts when I was, you know, and when I was carnal, I earned a few more. And Lord God, I release all my debts. Forgive me and cleanse me. And then he says something really strange. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Folks, there are people out there that won't be released of their debts because they've not forgot those that owe them. Huh? I've had, I got, you know how many people owe me money? And I probably owe a lot of people money too. But the idea is that's what he's not talking about. God cleansed you of all of your sinful debts. So now, when somebody wrongs you, don't hold it against them. Even if you say, well, I should hold it against them. They shouldn't have ever done that. Don't hold it against them. Because you've got a devil sitting there waiting for you to be unforgiving. So you have to forgive everybody all the time. But that doesn't mean you have to hang around them. Hello. You have to forgive everybody all the time. And then when a nasty memory comes up, you say, no, I've forgiven them. And you say it out loud. So your mind sees the picture of releasing the forgiveness. Boy, that was worth a lot. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. Folks, you can actually say, Father, make sure the devil's out of my life. All those temptations ahead are headed my way. Veer them off somehow in the name of Jesus. Lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God doesn't want you harassed by a mind molester. 
Yeah, Satan comes over, he, he speaks a lie in your brain, and you dwell on it all day long. Hello? Your boyfriend doesn't love you anymore. So what? God, he, he, he's got moods that change 20 times a day. You know, you start looking at things the way God sees them and stop taking those little ouches and pain so personal. Because there's just part of life. Folks, let me just tell you something my dad told me. Life, being born in this planet, is dangerous. This is an evil, dangerous planet. It's beautiful on one hand, but it's full of evil, danger, and will kill you. If you don't use a bit of wisdom, get to know God. Hello. Here's some guy who had all this money, all of this. He had everything he wanted, everything he wanted. Ends up in a little hotel room, crazier than a loon, because he wouldn't have a relationship with God. And if I mentioned his name, you'd all know him. Folks, with God, things come together. Without God, they all fall apart. Let's get God back in the schools. Let's get prayer back in the schools. Let's get in God we trust back in our conversation. And finishing. Okay? And then he says, For thine be the glory and the power forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So God says, Look, I've set you up. When you pray, connect. Show respect. To God. Show respect to God and He will give respect to you. Promote God and He will promote you. Isn't that great? Everybody that was exposed to God either got healed, got delivered, their lives were changed, and now the churches are saying, the pastors are saying, get back to your one-on-one -on -one with God and get back to finding out what he wants you to do in the weeks to come because it could be any day now. So the key is the truth. Our time with God means everything and must be first. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise? <laughs>